Landscape. Emira smiled at her colleague as he entered her office. How did you get on? she asked in an innocent tone. Cassian Itolia threw his arms up in the air in mock exasperation. They are impossible, utterly impossible. I've never met a more stubborn argumentative group in all the years we've been doing this. Intractable, inflexible, uncompromising. They're intolerable. Bad enough that we've got half a dozen families already arguing over whose claim has priority. Now this lot want to share? I can't believe you sent me to talk to them. I take it you told them there is no possibility of the Empire ceding the mountain to them then, she grinned. Seventeen times I told them. I counted. Seventeen times. They'd nod like they understood what I was saying, and then ten minutes later one of them would just bring it up again. It was like they simply could not contemplate the idea that we wouldn't just give them a mountain full of bloody mithril. Cassian's indignation caused Emira to fall apart laughing. She felt bad, but she'd spent two days negotiating with the House of Fire and Flame. It was definitely someone else's turn. After she regained her composure, she tried to empathise with her fellow civil servant. What can I say? They want the mountain. They really want it. But they can't bloody have it, said Cassian through gritted teeth. Realising just how much bargaining with the heralds had upset her normally carefree friend, she tried to cheer him up. Well, at least it's done. We can file a report, and that's the end of the matter, she pointed out. I wish? No, they want me to come back tomorrow, to discuss the possibility of them staking a claim. They wanted to stake a claim to the mithril, but they eventually dropped that after I told them for the tenth time that it wasn't legal. But they do want to stake a claim to some of the wealt silver. They're offering to pay taxes just like other claimants. His voice trailed off. He was getting nervous just thinking about what would happen when the truculent heralds encountered one of the volatile families currently poking round the bones of the mountain. Emira looked surprised. The heralds hadn't mentioned staking their own claim when she'd met them. Is that possible? she queried. Technically, yes. They're proposing to dig their own mines, to pay their taxes just like any other foreigner. So, yeah, technically I think it is. But just imagine what's going to happen the first time they have a run-in with the Inquisitor Domiro. We won't need any rondos to blow up the mountain then. Overview During the summer solstice 385YE, the generals of the military council voted for the heroes of Anvil to journey through the Sentinel Gate to Redgate Pass, following an offer from the House of Fire and Flame. Once on the field, the Imperials were able to negotiate the sale of ten rondures from the Heralds and transport them into position. The resultant cacophony was heard from miles around as the mountain was torn open, exposing the rich mineral wealth within. With the battle won and the area secured, the excitable Heralds of the Bronze Artisan have been assisting the civil service in their assessment of the area, making full use of the power of the Day Realm blanketing the Empire. And, as the heralds promised, some of the rewards look very promising indeed, if the Empire is able to afford to develop this new, accessible mineral wealth. The Red Depths The mountains of Karaman are rich in minerals, and Redgate Pass is no exception. At first, the assumption is that the mineral wealth will be rich seams of welt silver and green iron, but the metal-skinned heralds of Estavus are able to locate an even more valuable option. There are valuable deposits of mithril deep in the mountain. Unfortunately, the destruction of the mountain has rendered the area where the mithril is located vulnerable to further subsidence and collapse. As a result, the red depths will require expensive excavation and underpinning work to stabilise them before they can be operated safely. This will cost 170 thrones and take three months to complete. But once done, the mines would produce 16 wanes of mithril a season. The heralds of Estavus argue that this work is a waste of time, claiming it will only delay the construction of the mine and get in the way of exploiting the seam. But the civil service reports are very clear. Any attempt to operate the mine without this operation would be incredibly dangerous for the people working the mines, who would face a constant threat of death from any collapse. There is one alternative, however. The mining families of Karaman would very much like the new mine to be declared a national boss seat. 
They point out that Karaman has two boss seats already, and both of them are imperial positions. The rich mineral wealth of Karaman goes to the Empire, with none kept back for the people of Karaman. Mining is the lifeblood of the territory, and the mithril the mine produces would be invaluable to the families who dwell there. For that reason, they are prepared to offer their labour and expertise for the mining operations, but only if the seat is made a national position. If that happens, the cost to establish the Borse seat will be reduced to 50 thrones, and it would produce an additional three wanes of mithril each season, 19 in total. Of course, that would still leave a significant sum to find, but the families are hopeful that the Domiro of the Cinnabar Hills may be able to enlist additional funds from the freeborn who attend Anvil to support the seat being made national. The skilled mining families are not prepared to contribute their skills to the project under any circumstances if the seat is not made national, appointed by the tally of the votes. Mountain Home Mithril is not the only valuable metal that the explosive work of the Heralds of Estivus has revealed. There are significant deposits of other precious metals, mostly welt silver, but also some smaller veins containing orichalcum. What is more, it appears the influence of the nearby Autumn Regio means this area has been powerfully affected by the potent Autumn magic that was cast recently. The Estivus Heralds believe that there are a considerable number of bloodstones that could be identified and recovered if significant mine workings were established in the area. There are now dozens of opportunities to harvest the precious metals, and that presents a potential problem. A number of families are keen to exploit this wealth, but everyone can see it will be a recipe for disaster if it becomes a free-for-all. The families in Karaman have a fractious history, and while they welcome the idea of competition between themselves, nobody thinks it is a good idea for individual mining operations to directly compete. The potential for one family to literally undermine another with potentially disastrous consequences is simply too great. Normally, such issues would be left to the Domiro of the Cinnabar Hills to negotiate. But that title enjoys a wide-ranging remit, and the title holder is often called on to travel all over the territory. If the opportunities at Mountain Home, as it is already being called, are to be safely managed, it will need the active oversight of someone with authority who can be on site to oversee the works. Thus, the civil service proposed the creation of a mine captain, a traditional freeborn position for a mine foreman. The captain of Mountain Home will be able to ensure that the mines operate safely and the resulting opportunity to purchase some of the wealth the mines produce will ensure that they are adequately rewarded for their work. The captain will need a suitable office to house them and their subordinates, which will need a commission to construct. It will cost 15 white granite and 30 crowns and take one season to build. Once complete, the captain of Mountain Home would have access to a ministry that allowed them to purchase welt silver and orichalcum each season, as well as one or two bloodstones, if they could afford them. The House of Fire and Flame The collapse of Red Pinnacle was accomplished using the flasks of fire and fury created by the House of Fire and Flame. These delicate, volatile rondures barely contained powerful magic that once unleashed was enough to tear open the mountain. The House are a somewhat mercenary organisation and they were paid well for their efforts. However, they are now looking for additional compensation. In recognition of their efforts, they would like the Imperial Conclave to grant them permission to mine the newly exposed wealth of the mountain alongside the freeborn families. Of course, they would like the area ceded to them, but given the presence of mithril and other valuable materials here, nobody is remotely contemplating that, and it seems that it is not essential to their plans. Provided they don't have the enmity of the Conclave, then they can make use of the powerful Autumn Regio to deliver wagons filled with welt silver and orichalcum to the Autumn Realm, to be consumed by the ever-hungry forges of the Bronze Artisan. On the face of it, their proposal seems reasonable enough. In practical terms, it would be little different to a foreigner buying the mining rights to a claim or the land rights to a farm. They would pay their taxes, just like other foreigners and imperial citizens do. They find the idea of being subject to the captain of Mountain Home's oversight faintly ridiculous. They are utterly unconcerned by the prospect of a collapse in one of their mines, but they are prepared to tolerate that if it means they can access the wealth. 
Not everyone is sure this is a good idea. The House of Fire and Flame can be belligerent at best and bellicose at worst. They are difficult to get on with and it may not be wise to permit them to compete with the other freeborn families in the area. At the end of the day, the Empire owes them nothing. They were well paid for their help on the battlefield. The potential for conflict between the Heralds of the House and the fractious Brass Coast Miners is high. It would be easier to just politely decline, especially given that they are not offering anything beyond paying their taxes like any other occupants of the Empire. On the other hand, they were useful once. If they had a foothold in Serra da Marta, then who knows when they might be useful again. When asked about that, they are dismissive of the potential to make more rondures for the Empire to use on the future battlefield. They cite the need for their presence, a powerful autumn regio, and a mountain with serious seismic flaws, which represent a fairly unique combination of factors that is unlikely to be repeated any time soon. Given the nature of the situation, the civil service have asked the Imperial Conclave to provide advice on whether they should accept any mining claims put forward by the House of Fire and Flame. If the Conclave passes a Declaration of Concord offering to share the bounty of Redgate Pinnacle with them, then several members of the House of Fire and Flame will take up residence in the mountain immediately, delving deeply in search of the great wealth of ore and good quality stone that would be sent back to the towers of Calx and Coombe. This opportunity is only available for a single season. If there is no Declaration of Concord supporting the House's goals at the forthcoming summit, then they will go elsewhere. Risks Serra de Marta has been attacked multiple times in recent years, with the Yotun targeting the region to acquire some or all of the rich mineral wealth the land holds. They have been beaten back each time, but now that Fort Braden has been destroyed, the territory is more exposed than ever before. The collapse of the passes has improved the situation somewhat. It has made it impossible for the Yotun to move armies between northern Karaman and Liathavan and Reynos. That means that Serra de Marta cannot be attacked directly. However, that does not mean it is safe. The Jotun could still attack the region or carry out extensive raids if they first seized control of Gambit. Currently, Gambit is under imperial control, but in theory the Jotun could invade Gambit, and if they came in sufficient numbers they might take Serra de Marta at the same time. It wouldn't be easy. It would need a significant war host to achieve that in a season, but it's far from impossible. Creating a significant fortification in Gambit or Serra de Marta would improve the situation. Even a basic fortification in either of the two regions would make it harder for the Jotun to carry out a surprise attack. But a rank 2 or greater fort built in either region would offer significant protection to the entire territory and might deter attacks and raids on the Borse resources located in Serra de Marta. Without a significant fortification, it is only a matter of time before the Jotun make another attempt to take the area.